All right, welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond, season three, episode four. Man, this has been a long time coming to me not knowing what I was into, how to do a podcast, who to record with, to doing this and helping so many people be able to showcase their businesses, showcase their work, but also heal. You know, I think that is a one of the most prominent things about Resilient Voices and Beyond podcast. It's a place for people to share where they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what stage they are at, you know, in what they're going through um, to help somebody else and also to help themselves. So um, with that being said, get ready, get ready, get ready. Um, if you don't know who I am, it is season three. You know, if you just skip past one and two and you're just like, I'm just going to start here. That's fine. We love you just the same. My name is Michael D. Davis Thomas, a.k.a. MDDT Speaks. I am a former foster youth alumni, as many would say. I spent a little bit over 11 years in the Michigan child welfare system. I've been advocating inside residentials and outside residentials locally and federally since the age of 15. I have a decade of child welfare experience professionally. Um, who you know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I love doing this. You know, this is my ministry. I like to tell people. I, some people got pool picks. Some people, you know, um, do this and do that. Child welfare is my ministry, and I feel like I'm called to do it. So, with that being said, that's enough about me. Y'all really ain't here for me. I'm gonna throw it to my guest to introduce himself. Well, Mike, let me tell you. Uh, you said over a decade, man, and I, the more I think about it, it's literally over 25 years of, of doing yeah. this work. And um, similar to you, I started at a ripe young age of actually 16. Um, but I first started speaking uh, in middle school. So I think middle school was the first time I was able to read an essay on stage in front of people. Then from there, I went on to do almost every single play, you know, uh, imaginable. So theater, mm -hmm. stage, music has always been been my thing and being able to um, spend the last 25 years um, advocating and working um, inside and out of child welfare has been, like you said, my ministry. Uh, for those of you that do, don't know, my name is Jamal Callahan. I am, I have, I carry the pseudo name of Mr. Motivator. And uh, it's one of those things that my friends actually gave me because I was always giving wisdom when they ask. Mind you, I said wisdom when they ask, not, you know, I, didn't, <laughs> I never gave unsolicited advice. Right, but, right. Um, you know, but being on, on being able to be in front of people and actually motivate them to, to be their, the best versions of themselves is just something that I was able to turn into a lifestyle, a business, um, a way of life, but also understanding that this is a calling and this is, you know, something that, I would not have strayed from uh, even even if it even if it was things that said you need to go do something else. Mm -hmm. I would always have been led back to the work that I do. So I've been able to literally um, shift, you know, people at one at a time uh, from foster parent trainings to staff trainings to helping systems and organizations do things differently with consulting. Um, and then just being able to be a mentor to some and, you know, a friend to others. But other than that, man, it's uh, the work that I do. I do it proudly, but also the work that I do, I do it because it's needed. So, but we definitely can get in that. We, we, I think we got our episode to, to dive into <laughs> some of that work. Definitely. Definitely. I, I just think it's something you said that's just ringing, ringing in my ear, you know, um, the many people, you know, that say, oh, go try something else or what have you. And I just know from my personal story, I've tried football. I've tried, you know, music, sports, every indoors just shut, you know. And, and mm. it's just like once I finally, okay, you know, for me, and, I, you know, I know other people may be different religions on here, but for me, I'm a Christian. So, you know, um, 
when I finally was like, okay, God, where you want me to go? You know, yeah. it was just, all right, you're going to start speaking in front of these people, you know, and when I tell people and I hear other people's story, you know, you know, who has very similar experiences, like, you know, me and yourself, you know, it's just like, look, I, w- I wish some days I could just go do this, but you know, it ain't that easy. You know, I've tried it, mm-hmm. you know, but this is where I'm supposed to be. And I won't take that for granted. You know, I won't, you know, turn that away because this has been a life worth living. You know, I've been able oh, yeah. to see some things, do some things and just be rewarded, you know, within my heart and within my soul and within my spirit in a way that I don't see I would have been rewarded in any of those other positions or jobs. 100 percent uh you know and and i've done a lot of things now i will say this the jobs that i've had even you know when i was first starting out were still all rewarding Mm -hmm. they were in this space of helping people um connecting with people and i've literally loved every minute of it i don't think there was a there was a position that i held since high school where it wasn't about people and uh being a servant and you know and and like like you said, I'm a man of faith. Um, you know, the Bible said to serve, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you go into the building, you go into the house to worship and you leave to serve. My bishop taught me that. And um that's how I live, that's how I live. You know, I live to serve. Definitely, definitely. Well, you know, I'm gonna get us started with my first question. You know, it's more of a question for a statement, you know, but help me in the audience, because I know mm. a little bit about you, you know, I've been following, I, I've been, you know, um, I forget how you said it, but, you know, advocate, advocate observant, I'm going to say that, you know, some people do people <laughs> watching, I'll be, you know, watching advocates and different things I like watch that, advocates. Watch how they yeah. move, how they walk, how they talk, you know, and seeing, you know, what they're doing. So can you help me, you know, and the audience better understand, you know, um, the timeline of your journey to be at where you are today? I, I don't think we have that much time, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I mean, you also understand, ladies and gentlemen, I am a very seasoned 43 year old. And actually in 2023, I'll be 44. So, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a long time coming, but I will say this, um, the reason why I'm into this work and the reason why, you know, any of us do this is the simple fact that we lived it, right? You know, we lived the experience, we saw the flaws in the system, and we said, somehow, we need to make a change. So sometimes, somehow, I need to make a change. And that's what happened. Uh, Back in the early, early 90s, I was actually introduced to uh, experiencing foster care because my mom that she was having her issues you know a lot of us said well, why don't you you know part, first part of therapy is says just admit everything that's happened right um and but what I don't want to do is I don't want to shame you know because having a mental having a drug addiction is part of having a mental illness yeah and or being sick so in my older age I understand that my mom had a sickness and it was the three of us, me, my older brother, my younger sister. And uh, next thing you know, it was a knock on the door. It's social worker and the sheriff. They remove us. Um, my brother took off. And most people who know me know this story. But this is new. These are new people. So, hey, new people. <laughs> but <laughs> my brother, he took off and basically told the system to, you know, you know where to go. My younger sister went to go live with her father, and then it was that left me, the middle child, going into uh, experience foster care. It was that time where I experienced nine uh, nine moves, six years, emancipated out, and I'm giving you the Rito's Digest version that also tells you how old I am because who talks about Rito's Digest anymore? <laughs> um, but so yeah, aged out, ended up going to college, didn't want to, ended up going though um, for music. And then, you know, life truly started uh, from there. Had kids, four beautiful children. Um, but, and mind you, in that time I was in college, uh, I was still speaking, advocating, um, mm-hmm. all, you know, where we're where called to, right? Mm-hmm. Always going back to, going back home to Columbus, Ohio, and speaking for agencies and staff and things like that. Um, 
and then get into the professional world. You know, I worked in a nursing home uh, while in college and then uh, moved on to working in the children's hospital. And, you know, after that, working for um, a medical lab. I mean, so things just started still taking off, but still finding those times to, mm-hmm. to advocate and speak up and be involved and travel and do those things. And uh, one of the, one of the things that I, I really, and then when you talk about taking leaps of faith, you know, I went to my, this is when I was working for a major, major corporation. Um, it was probably the second largest medical lab or lab business in, in the United States or Northern America. And I was up the ladder. I was upper management, making good money. You know, as former foster youth, you know, we only dream about making a living where we can sustain and and mm-hmm. be okay. And I was at that point, right? And I got one of my first opportunities to speak um, at a national conference. And I went to my CEO. I said, hey, you know, I really need to take this week off. Um, and it was, you know, months down the road. I need to take this week off. I got a wonderful opportunity and, you know, I, I want to do it. And, you know, he was like, yeah, I can't, I can't give you those. I can't give you those days off. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I thought about it. I walked out of his office, literally turned back around, walked in his office, turned in my resignation letter. And I didn't have a, an official plan. I've had business. I've had at that time one business running, and it was an entertainment business where I was uh, me and my partner. We were managing artists. We were booking shows. We were traveling. We were doing that too. Not to mention we were throwing parties in clubs. So, you know, this is you know this is in my twenties, twenties, ooh, late twenties, and um, I decided to give up my corporate career to basically do this full time again had no plan <laughs> i had kids to feed i think i had two kids at the time um no actually we just had our third and then um we just had our third and i'm like i don't lord i don't know what we doing but uh let's let's go nervous as hell <laughs> nervous mm-hmm. you know talking to my wife like at the time mm-hmm. I don't know how we do. I don't know how we gonna do this, but here we go. So, fast forward, here we are. You know, just pulling and pulling, pulling all of the stops, making sure that um, not no stone is left unturned in child welfare, but where the work is needed, where the voice is needed, I just try to be there. Definitely. Wow. Wow. I'm just, you know. Rolling back, you know, all those different things you said, you know, and it's a couple of things that stood out to me that I kind of want to circle sure. back to, if you don't let's mind. Do it. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. The show show. Um, the show show. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talked about taking that leap, taking that mm. risk, you know. Um, and I think like I do like a lot of peer support and mentoring. And one of the things that I, I tell people when I'm doing my peer support is that sometimes you got to take a sacrifice when it's in the life to get to that greater thing, you know. And a lot of times we use the word sacrifice or you say take a risk, you know, it, it kind of has a negative kind of connotation to it. Like it, it kind of is like, oh, no, you know, I'm comfortable. I'm good. I'm, you know, but. I'm pretty sure you can attest to this, you know, many times that comfortable place can often be tied to a place of settling when -hmm. you could have more or you could be in a better place, you know, or, or, or or who knows what is behind that corner, you know, but, you know, I'm a firm believer that we all have a plan. We all have a plan that's already written out for us. You know, we all have a purpose and, you know, unfortunately (laughs) due to, the many different obstacles and, and barriers, you know, very few people truly go towards that full purpose that they're supposed to go to. Um, and a lot of that is because when that final moment to make that sacrifice, to make that leap, to take that risk, you know, a lot of people, uh, I'm good, you know? <laughs> so Here for, 
the alumni out there, for the youth out there, for, you know, um, those individuals, you know, um, what, I, I, and I'm going to add this a little bit later, but I think it's really pivotal. pivotal. That's probably not a word, but y'all can give me later. We'll take it. Um, we'll take it. <laughs> um, at this moment to really get that advice, because we're coming out of a pandemic. Mm. A lot of people understand their worth and their value now when they're doing these jobs and they're not settling for what the status quo was, but also right. they're not taking these risks. They're not taking these le leaps. I know a lot of you for like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do this. I want to, you know, I don't think college is for me. You know, I want to take a trade, you know, and we speak on these dreams, but we're not going for them. What advice do you have for these individuals out there? And you can make it however way you want to. I'm gonna leave. Listen, I, I'll, I'll say this, fear is inevitable. Fear is inev inevitable. It's something that's not going to go away, um, and that's something that we you're going to you're going to just have to face head on. Um, trust me, when I made the decision to walk, it wasn't because I was confident. And I knew that I was going to replace you know sixty thousand dollars a year. No, I was mm -hmm. like, how in the hell am I going to replace sixty thousand dollars a year? Mm -hmm. You know, doing what I'm called to do, um, even though the mechanics and the the groundwork of, you know what? I can make more in a weekend or in an hour than a two week paycheck. So I knew it was possible, right? But it was still that fear that once I walked out these doors, that guaranteed income stops. Yeah, And I think that's what scares a lot of people the guaranteed income, the crutch. And I used to call it the crutch, right? If you wanted to do something, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you had a great business idea. Sometimes we don't move forward or we don't take that next step because the crutch of the every day, right? The mm -hmm. crutch of knowing that every two weeks, every Friday, you know, you got a paycheck coming in. Not to mention the life of an entrepreneur is not as glamorous as people you know, that as you see, right. You know, yeah. what they, what they, the things they don't talk about, oh, you have to pay for private insurance. This is not mm -hmm. something that your employer is paying for. And, you know, the average, the average self-pay insurance it, it is almost $1,300 a month coming out of your pocket. Right. So these are things they don't, that, you know, we, we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So there's those, it's that it's, you know, once you get a contract, you know, they, and that contract ends in a year, what are you doing after that? Right. So fear is there because I've, I've been there. I've been in a space where I'll have a contract and then, you know, three months before this contract is done, it's like, okay, Jamal, what's next? You decided to be an entrepreneur. What's mm -hmm. next? Um, but another thing I will say, talked about fear is we have to learn to to live intentionally right you know everyone has good intentions there's a saying that says live intentionally not with good intentions it's perfect in this space because how often do we say why well, I, I intended to mm -hmm. right i intend to do this I, I want to do that i intend when you intend to do something you forget yeah but th that becomes an excuse um well, I, I intended to reach out to that person or I intended to submit my resume. I intended and it doesn't happen. Think about that when you flip it and say, I'm doing this intentionally. Like I'm intentionally saying hi. I'm intentionally reaching out to people, even though it's not going to bear fruit now, mm -hmm. but I'm intentionally reaching out. I'm intentionally building those bridges of relationships. So I think to answer you, that was a long way of answering your question. But we have to be intentional. The fear is going to be there. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do something, you got to find your support system. Yeah. But also understanding that when you look for your support, your best friend, your, your, your foster parent, your mother, anybody, understand that if they don't clearly find what you're doing valuable to them, don't discount it. Yeah. Because there's a firm saying that says, God didn't give anyone else your vision, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They gave it to you. It's your job. It is your job to make that vision manifest into reality. And it doesn't matter what people say about it, right? Because it was given to whom? You. It was given to you. Think about it. I mean, if you, I mean, so we can, we can, let's just go there, right? Because I'll tell you what I found out <laughs> in my earlier life that I found out in my earlier life that uh, not only my biological father, but his father and I got uncles and, and brothers on my dad's side, all preachers. Mm-hmm. So let's let, so let me give that some context and take it there. Moses was given a vision of building the ark mm-hmm. and everybody thought he was crazy. Mm-hmm. Everybody thought he was crazy until it started raining. So for all of you that are listening, that vision was only given to you. You might not know how to accomplish it yet, but I'm telling you, you write it down, you make it plain and you, you just work at it, but don't be stupid like I was and just did, right? Uh-huh. Create that plan. I didn't, cre- I didn't create a plan. I just made it. I just was like, all right, I'm gonna take this risk, but I had support to do that. Right. When you have support to do that, it makes it a little easier. A lot of us are doing this by ourselves and we have Mm -hmm. zero support. Right. Zero support. So find your support system. Make a plan. People don't. What's that? What they say? People don't plan to fail. They fail to Mm -hmm. plan. That's facts. Right. Yeah. And be and be okay with failing a few times. Don't get shook. <laughs> Don't get shook. Because once you stick at it and you, I mean, what, and it's okay to pivot. I think I said a lot in that, but it's okay to pivot too. So definitely. You you mentioned something there that really struck me. It, it struck a memory that I want to share with you and the audience. You know, I remember when I was in this in-between stage between juvenile and you know my sister had guardianship over me and it really wasn't working out it kind of became a little bit abusive and I told the course I didn't want to go back home Hmm. everything in me you know I I remember like praying that night before and I was like God whatever answer you tell me to say when I go to court whatever comes out first I'm gonna go with it they asked me do I want to go back home I told them no and I had perfectly good reasons why not it was just no no we had the court you know for a while and they end up um shipping me over to the juvenile facility and I'm like in my head I'm seeing the same bars the same gates that I went 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 through um Mm -hmm. as a juvenile and I'm like I'm asking for help you know I'm asking you know to be saved some safety and I'm getting persecuted for, for help that in my mind that's where I was they took me beyond the juvenile to a holding facility called Mandy's place it wasn't too much better it still was locked up you know <laughs> and what have you um and for me throughout my time at care um my faith was present Um, I think I started to build and develop a really tight relationship with my faith and and God and what have you within that. But I still needed to define it. And there was Mm -hmm. moments throughout my time in care, um, speaking specifically about this uh, moment where I remember praying um, when I got there. And then because this was like a shelter kind of thing, the other people could come to cross rooms, you know? And one of the other guys was like, hey, can I pray with you? It's like, sure. You know, only prayer I really knew at that point in time was the Lord's prayer. You know, and I tried to make my little twist to it. You know, it was Mm -hmm. that not, that wasn't the only one because I knew like the God is good, God is great. Thank you for the food, you know, but I'm not, you know that. (laughs) Yep. But I knew the Lord's friend, so yes. I would pray that and make a little twist, you know. And, you know, I was a kid, so I'm asking for things, you know. God, if you let me, you know, get out today, live my life, go get a job, get a car, you know, things that really wasn't about to happen. But I remember by the time I left that place, um, pretty much my whole unit was praying with me. 
and I didn't mm. realize the the impact. The yeah, the impact of that. You know, until like thinking about that as an adult, like you know, and I know everybody. Let me make this. Let me trans translate this for everybody to be able to consume this. You know how the world we got Democrats and Republicans, we can hardly come together at, to be able to sit in the same room without saying this way or that way. Mm-hmm. You have individuals of different gangs, you know, individual trauma, individuals who grew up inherently just racist, individuals who are claiming that they were Satanists, you know, individuals with so many different things and baggage. Mm-hmm. Leaving that behind to just come together in this moment in solidarity. And I I think about that and I'm like, okay, all right, God, you know, that really ain't clicked to me. And then I think later on in life, and I remember going to be in this pilot program of independent living. And I was like, no, I really just want to leave the system or what have you. I just stay in this residential until I'm out. They were like, well, Michael, you know, we need someone to start the pilot. And I think about all the people that I was in that when I went in there, it was six of us all together. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think now to today, I'm one of six who've made it out, you know, in technical sense successfully. But when I say technical sense successfully, each and every one of those individuals I still keep in contact with, you know, I, I still remember, you know, I still hold dear to my heart and they have been a pivotal moment for myself. So those, each and every one of those individuals, conveniently enough, I went later on in life and worked in a residential facility. I actually worked for um, a residential facility and one of my own night staff that, you know, mm. used to tell me to go to bed and uh, being give it their supervisor, you know. Um, How and, you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I had six six guys in that in there that I had to make sure were good and what have you, I was over. And I remember telling them this statistic that statistics shows that one of y'all out of the six of y'all are going to make it out of here. Mm-hmm. And they held on to that. I ended up leaving the job, what have you, and going to, we have like MYOY, Michigan Youth Opportunity Initiative here in the state Mm -hmm. of Michigan. And I've always been active in that, going to like a Pistons game. Two of the guys was like, Mr. DT, how you doing? Look, I just want you to know I made it out, you know? And then the other one come around, what up, Mr. DT? I just want you to know what you said to me stuck to me. And I think about the things that we go through and and the risks that we have to take. I completely, in that moment, when they were taking me to the juvenile, was like, bump this. I go back home, take the abuse. You know, for me, prior to foster care, I didn't see myself making it past 16 or 18. And that was something that I was willing to sacrifice to just be like, live my life to the fullest to today but something within me made me make that decision to leave and I think about all the different individuals who were impacted by me but also all the different individuals I was impacted by and now I'm returning that by that small sacrifice of comfortability you bring up some amazing uh some amazing thoughts and points like part of what I'm able to do now too um is I teach life skills class for actually the county I was a part of. So, and, you know, we were in person, of course, the pandemic hit, we had to move everything virtual. Um, but one of the things I get out of teaching these life skills classes is that I'm able to pour directly into the young people that are experiencing the same things that we've experienced, um, whether they're in uh, a regular home, whether they're in a group home, a residential facility, uh, we're able to touch all of them, right? And 
to think about where we started week one to where we end at week 10 mm -hmm. and what we've been able to accomplish in 10 weeks. Yeah. You see the attitude changes. Some of them you don't see right away, but you know, what do I tell workers and, and foster parents? You're not going to see nine times out of 10, you're not going to see the fruits of the seeds that you plant. Right. I was just doing uh, the Wendy's wonderful kids summit and I did a, I did three workshops for them. And we, the conversation in the room was how many young people do you think have come across your desk that you supported or you've helped become adopted? And it was one in particular worker that said thousands. And I asked them, I said, has any of them ever reached out and said, thank you. And there's been a few, right. But I had to tell them, I said, our job is to continue to pour into and plant these yeah. seeds and walk away mm -hmm. and completely walk away and be okay with not knowing the full outcome of how that young person turns out. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's our job. That's what we do. Yeah. That's where we should grab the, the, the sense of, of comfort from, mm -hmm. right? You know, I said all too often we focus on the negative. We, uh, we focus on, well, that kid is in trouble now, or that kid is, you know, going through juvenile justice now, mm -hmm. but what tools have you given him that he's just not ready to apply yet? Right. Right. So part of us doing what we do is for in giving back is just being able to equip these young people with tools, understanding mm -hmm. that they might not be ready to deal or utilize those tools right off hand. Mm -hmm. but I listen I would rather give those tools and plant that seed than not do it at all yes and that's at every level so mm -hmm. you're talking about working at the county level all the way up to doing the federal work that we both do right mm -hmm. and being able to write legislation and get them passed through congress and you know start helping people immediately right yeah. so it's about still planting those seeds knowing that you might not ever see the fruits of it mm -hmm. i just that's just how i feel about it yeah i um i was talking i was talking to uh, you you seen that i went to california i went recently went to mm -hmm. california and i was talking to you uh former representative karen bass mayor Karen Bass. Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Let, let, put some respect yeah, no, on, I'm, I'm, on her look, name. Look, yeah. I'm going to add every title that she get into when I say her name. <laughs> and yeah. I know most of y'all know uh, Karen Bass and the work and the support she's given just this mm -hmm. movement, you know, when yeah. she was, you know, when she was in the Capitol. Oh my God. Her office was so supportive of the foster youth to the foster youth initiative um mm -hmm. and so many other bills and that are now legislation to push child welfare forward they yeah. so i i was sad that she left the capital but she la needed her la yeah. needed her yeah you know um the work is not done you know la la county in itself holds a huge percentage within the national percentage. So, the you largest. know, um, her work, you know, can be monumental in what we see in child welfare, you know, tomorrow. Um, but I remember talking with her and, and listening and um, she was speaking and she said that um, um, us as representatives, you know, um, and she was speaking about her colleagues, you know, from her former job as being a representative. Um, she was saying, us as representatives, you know, we may not always remember, like, the meetings, you know, like, all these different committees and all this other stuff, but we remember the stories. Yeah. We remember the people, you know, and yeah. that just sticks with me because I'm just like, you know, I've done so much and I can't, people be like, oh, I know you and I go to places and I really, you know, I, I'd be like, I you know, and then I hear their voice or I hear they, I see their face and I'm like, I know, I know you. Um, I'm so excited, you know, um, for this next journey that I have, 
uh, which leads into my next question conveniently, this next journey. Um, recently, you know, got my own apartment after losing my place in like 2017, 2018. I've been, and most people know, I've been advocating throughout that stint of time um, in housing and stability. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. while still going to school, while, you know, um, and I recently, this will technically be my third apartment slash really second um, on my own apartment and what have you. And most people are like, you know, Michael, you've been doing all this stuff, but you, you know, your stuff's not together or what have you. One thing about the advocacy that I do and, and advocacy that many people that I'm seeing like yourself do is um, it's very authentic, it's very real, it's very to your experience, you know? And, and, and um, that's something that as I was learning, as I was growing as an advocate, I've had people that were very blunt, very real tell me some things but also watching other advocates I was like when I advocate it doesn't matter the specific circumstance or what have you if I want to see change I need to one humble myself you know mm -hmm. but also you know speak to the truth you know why am I homeless why why am I struggling you know what tools or tips did I not get you know and Partly as I was advocating, you have a lot of individuals be like, well, you know, the system didn't set me up for this and that. That's one point. That's one. But also, what could have you done? You know, and that's something that I, I speak about in my advocacy, you know, and taking that ownership, taking that responsibility, you know, like there's certain things um, that happened in my life, which led to me losing my place and getting evicted once upon a time ago. You know, mm -hmm. even though there was a domino effect that came after it, there was a certain level of comfortability I had settled in within my mind and also not undealt with institutionalization, you know, and PTSD, you know. So all these different things trickled in impulsive decision making, you know, um, yeah. and, and also not knowing how to ask for help. Um, it took me going into a state of homelessness and really being in a place where I didn't really have too much to worry about to really see from a clear lens of, okay, Michael, what do you see for? Like, you, you don't have nothing else to your name. What do you see for? How are you going to do this? Because the way you were operating wouldn't work. Right. So, you know, one, the number one part was working on my mental health, you know, working on my mental health. And, and one, and this would be the pivotal part that a lot of people don't know this, why I advocate and why I continue to advocate wasn't to not be able to focus on myself. I learned from a very young age doing stuff with MYOI that when I spoke and told my story, it helped me heal. You know, it was like talk therapy for myself. And I know that's not for everybody, so I continued to advocate and tell my story because it was part of my therapy, you know, <laughs> part of my healing process. Um, and um, as you will see, I will, it, I'm pretty sure there's some kind of recordings or certain things like when I find older that people will pull out the woodworks, you know, <laughs> um, you will see the well, transition definitely. from, you know, more colorful language to more eloquent speaking. <laughs> You know, and just growing, you can it see the, the growth of healing throughout that. And, and I say that because a lot of people, you know, um, that I'm seeing um, within my community, my brothers and sisters, that are alumni, are functioning through their trauma, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not really addressing it due to stigmas, you know, due to labels, or, but also, um I'm going to add to, and some people be mad at me, but that's okay. You know, a lot of cultural things that they're holding on to. You uh, know, I remember growing up, and I probably say this a lot. Y'all yeah, probably like he always mentioning it, but I is, keep mentioning it because truth. it happens all the time, and it still yeah. happened today. Oh, that ain't nothing, baby. Go pray about it. You know. <laughs> That's fine. Yes. Pray about it. Yes, please. You know, like, I, like I'm, I'm going to do I that pray too. All the time, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. But also 
go talk to somebody that can help you break that down so you can continue to do the work. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody had heard it, whether you're Christian or not Christian, faith without work is dead. Exactly. You have to do something. Even exactly. doctors, you know, mental health professionals, psychologists will tell you, you know, medication, you know, it's not just the medication. 50% the medication, 50% you. You have to work with whatever you're doing. If you want a good job, you want your job to work, you want to have a positive impact, you know, but if you go to your job negative all the time, God's been talking about everybody, you know, but it don't matter what your <laughs> job look like, your job is going to be right. horrible because mm -hmm. of what you're coming in there with, you know. So spinning this around to my question, because I rambled on, how That's has right. mental health and self-care played a role? in your life and what are some of the barriers that you have faced if comfortable sharing well i'll, I'll, I'll tell the, i'll say this um i've actually been full throttle into um personal therapy for about almost two years now and um it's helped me do a lot now I say that in the saying something I've always told people I've mentored even before going to therapy was, you know, if you haven't healed from your, your trauma, then I, I would advise you not to talk about it because people pay you, you know, if you're being hired to speak somewhere and to give wisdom, they pay you to do that. Um, and if you get up there and people might not agree with me when I say this, but if you get up there and you completely break down telling your story, um, while people in the audience are probably going to be like, oh, you know, the people who paid you to be there, you know, that might not be a good recommendation because yeah. you, you've, you've cracked right under pressure. And you're talking about some, some past traumas that you haven't fully healed from. Yeah. And it's hard once you break like that, especially on stage or in the training room, it's hard to pull it back. Right. It's hard to get regain that command of of the stage. Mm -hmm. But mental health and dealing with your mental health is something that is um, is important. You know, it's so important that even with our children now, it's. You're going to see somebody because there's some things that mom and dad can't help you with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, taking that into consideration that our children have had some of the hardest experiences now, mm -hmm. right? In the last few years, then even my foster care experience, I mean, they that trumps their my foster care experience. Mm -hmm. When you have two friends, not one, two friends have successful suicides. We're talking high school and middle school. When you have bomb threats and threats to shoot the school up and, you know, you have all of those things Mm -hmm. encompassed in a school day and you know when your kids come to you and say I don't want to go to school today but you're like no get up you're going to school because that's what as parents that what we're supposed to do and mm -hmm. then you drive up to the school and the school is littered with police and dogs because mm -hmm. there was a bomb threat or a threat to shoot the school up I couldn't imagine experiencing that mm -hmm. And these are some, these are just some things that my kids, my own personal kids and millions of other kids are experiencing. Yeah. Uh, you look at the stats of how many school shootings has happened this year alone. Way too many, mm -hmm. way too many. So understanding that, yes, I'm going to sit, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray about it. But I'm also keep my weekly appointment with my therapist to say, this is what the hell's going on. <laughs> and I don't know how to process this. Uh -huh. And, you know, I'm learning. And I don't think there really has been any barriers to therapy. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's been my own barrier throughout the years. I don't have enough time. I'm flying yeah. here. I'm flying there. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm running this business. I'm running that. Business. So it, for me, I was my own barrier because mm -hmm. I didn't think I had time. Yeah. And then it got to a point where I was like, you know what? I got time today. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got time today and I took it serious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes life throws those things at you to make you say it's time. And yeah. it was time. 
it was time and I haven't stopped. Um, so it, it's very important. Um, but also it's also important for you to be vulnerable and transparent. Yeah. Um, not with your therapist, but with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. There's been many a days I've, I've thought before that I was over, you know, the effects of my father not being there. And then now, you know, at 36, when I first met him, thinking I was still okay with it when I wasn't, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was just, so those things, those things are, are needed. Mm -hmm. um, but now there are so many tools. There was an article I was reading a few months ago. Um, a university was creating therapy, like therapy sessions virtually autonomously on your phone so you download an app and this is geared towards young people you download the app and you just check in you check in every day or you check in every week and it helps you supposedly helps you work through you know whatever is needed right mm -hmm. so the space for mental health is getting wider broader smarter more um more nuanced to be normal but still, when you think of therapy, there's still the stigma in the black community. You know, you don't go talk about your problems to nobody. But first of all, I got a black therapist. Thank you. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we do. And part of my job as as a father is to say these are things that society says is not normal. But I'm here to tell you that they are. Right. I'm here mm -hmm. to tell you that they are. So. I would tell anybody, like anybody. I mean, I've I've had a cousin who, and it was and it was crazy because I had just found out she was my brother's daughter on my dad's side. I had just met that side of the family, but mm -hmm. something happened, and next thing you know, I get a call. Your niece, you know, had a successful suicide. Well, whoa, wait a minute, time out. Why are we not comfortable to talk to people? You know, life is hard, mm -hmm. but life is harder on the people that care about you if you're not here. Yeah. Right. So while we, while some, some of us can probably think this is, this is probably the lowest and the hardest that life will ever be. And mm -hmm. for me, I don't want to live through it. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, live through it because there's glory on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I equate that as funny because, you know, as much as we fly, right? And I look at everything as a message. You know, um, I remember taking off, I think it was from Denver one day. And, and it was in the winter. And if you've been to Denver in the winter, it's not a place you really want to be. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, we're taking off and, you know, the snow is just coming down and we're going up and we're going through the clouds. And I'm like, this is rough. And I, I'm, I'm the, I'm the window seat guy. So every <laughs> flight that I'm on, I got, I'm in a window seat, <laughs> but we're going up and I'm looking and I'm just staring out the window and I'm seeing the snow. I'm seeing these clouds and I'm like, Oh, this is rough air. This is crazy. But then there's that moment where you're above the clouds and everything is calm and you see the sun and he's like, wait a minute what did I just go through? Mm -hmm. That's life. Yeah. Like that, that truly is life. And if we just push through just a little while longer, just a little harder, I guarantee you that, that other side, mm -hmm. not to say things aren't going to come back in your life. That's going to, that's, that's going to trip you up. But that yeah. other side that mm -hmm. other side is beautiful. That other side is beautiful. But that other side wouldn't be beautiful without the support of professionals who know how to help you get through these things. Yeah. Right. So that's, I mean, and then self care. I will be for the second thing, the first one to tell you that I, as much as I want to say I practice self care a lot, my self care is, is standing by a, a body of water. Um, being by water, like right now on my property, I have a pond, like literally I'm looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, I'll walk around the pond 
or there's a reservoir that's close and I walk to the reservoir and just, you know, hear the waves. But that's that's how I that's how I recharge. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's my self-care. I'm at the age where I'm I'm not getting up. <laughs> I'm not getting up at five o'clock in the morning to go to the gym. I'm I'm just not, <laughs> you know. I have, you know, I have good and back to the whole intention thing. I have good intentions too, but mm-hmm. it don't happen. Yeah. Um but those things that do add to my self-care, my kids add to my self-care, my family adds to my self-care. Um, being able to provide and do for them is, is my self-care. Um, mm-hmm. And then being able to get out and make change, right? So people say, well, you should do, you should do something else other than that. I'm like, no, that's like, I get excited when I'm in front of five, 500 people, yeah. right? I get like, I'm like energized when I get in front of two people because mm-hmm. here's a moment for me to do God's will and yeah. impart some wisdom and change some minds, right? Um, so that's just, that's my self-care. And again, when it comes to mental health, listen, be honest, be honest with yourself. If you can't handle it on your own, find somebody to hold that hand and walk you through it. Definitely. You, yeah. you spoke about a lot there. You dropped a lot of gems and, you know. Just tell me things. to slow down. Just, 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 just no, tell me no, to slow no. down. <laughs> You doing you doing great, like you know. It's a couple of things you said, um, in, in in the early aspects of what you were saying um, about advocacy, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I know there's a lot of people in this space, and um, I'm a, I'm gonna say it, y'all. Look, please don't be mad at Michael. You know, you what's the, it's a song that said you understand it better by and by. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you understand it better later. You know, mm-hmm. but. This is for all my advocates, all my young advocates, you know, uh, and I'm talking specifically to those people who know they need to do some work within themselves. It is okay to take time for yourself. It is okay to work on yourself. Because I promise you this, when all is said and done, when there's no more degrees for you to chase after, when there's no mm-hmm. more promotions to, for you to to go and get, you own a company at this point, you know. Yeah. Um, there's no more cars or you know, girlfriends, boyfriends, you know, whoever, you know, for you to get. You're gonna be there with your thoughts. Mm-hmm. And what will you do then? Because you've been running from those thoughts. Yeah. You know, been and even thoughts. though you're in a room full of people, you still feel that sense of loneliness. So I just, you know, I ask you guys as as a brother, as someone who loves you all to please take some time. There's nothing against advocating, you know, um, if you can. Because if and the thing is, when you advocate, you want people to be able to hear you and receive what you're saying. You want people to be yeah. receptive. You know, and one thing I learned, somebody checked me really well and and advocating, they were like, you know, when you go and advocate in front of these legislators, you can't go and break down because then they're going to no. shut down on you. No. Like, they're, like, they're not they, they, going to be, because the they can't, they can't conceptualize or, or they, they can't really understand because you made them uncomfortable. Now it's a very uncomfortable, and not saying that as bad or what have you and it's not everybody but everybody has had that moment where you're wondering why that one one friend is crying and you don't know what to do Hmm. You, you know let me let me say there's a difference between being passionate mm-hmm. and not being um and not fully healing yeah right? Because you can be passionate and you can get your point across. But if that passion turns into anger. Yeah. Or because it's like, because there's been many times I've been in meetings, advocacy meetings. And yes, we're passionate about what's happening and we're frustrated that things are happening the way we think they should. But when that passion turns into disrespect and or that conversation moves from passion to disrespect, you do, you t- you're going to turn a lot of people off. 
you're going to turn yeah. a lot of people off and we so we have to be careful these Definitely. spaces are valuable and we have to be we have to be very careful Definitely. You know, so that's that's my little unsolicited. Y'all can throw it away or take it <laughs> with you. I look, it, it ain't gonna hurt me none. I promise. Um, but that leads me to my other point. You've done a lot of advocacy hmm. in in many different sectors, many different spaces, many different states, you know, and and, and across this nation. Um and and Something that sticks out to me is the advocacy you've done and the work you've done and the policy work you've done um, mm. to help with, I believe it's the, correct me if I'm wrong, the FYI voucher. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, That's you correct. know, um, you know, I wasn't going to bring you on here. <laughs> 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 now, you know, because we could talk about everything else, but yeah. you, you know, I, I, I cannot express to you how much your work, your time, and your effort have impacted individuals I've seen face to face. Mm -hmm. And I want to, you know, first, you know, the audience can say it too, you know, but say, I appreciate you putting yourself on the line and taking that time to do so. You know, I, oof. I'm sure many advocates um, they don't they don't get into advocacy and speaking for our brothers and sisters in care to be self serving. Um, when it came to the housing vouchers, we knew. I mean, everybody knows the stats, right? Mm -hmm. Within a year, you know, thirty two percent nationally of our young people wind up homeless. Um, there's a need there. Right. Mm -hmm. As much as we loved, we love uh, Disney cartoons. There was, um, oh, I forgot the name of that movie. I forgot the name of the movie. And well, basically, the, the tagline or the line that was headed in the movie was see a need, fill a need. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it had to do something with invention. So it was an invention uh, uh, cartoon. But mm -hmm. it was see, see, a, see a need, fill a need. And when it comes to advocacy, we knew that if our kids were becoming homeless, yeah. then they were trying to find ways to not be homeless, which then turned into activities of survival, which could be labeled as crime. Then, right, so now I'm in prison or I'm in jail because I this is where I'm going to be living because I can't find anywhere else to live. Yeah. Right. So there's that this trickle down effect of of homelessness. So you know one of our one of our uh, youth advisory board members uh, said that we happened to be in a meeting uh, with legislators, and she said we have to cut off the spigot of homelessness from our system. Yeah, we do, and this is how we're going to do it, right? So, and it's not just me; it's it's so many other people as well mm -hmm. that was on this project. And now, don't get me wrong, I go hard for <laughs> for for housing. And you know, and I just got some updated numbers from from HUD. like we've we've served over the FYI voucher has served over thirty six hundred young people across the nation mm. housed for three years. it's it's uh it's it's overwhelming, but at the same time, I don't go into this to be again self-serving or to say this is what I've done. I go mm -hmm. into it because it's a need. Yeah. Right. We we need to change things because our our young people don't have sometimes a pot to piss in or a leg to stand on. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do we do that? We talk to legislators, we talk to the authorities that are over the, those jurisdictions. We try to make something happen. That's exactly yeah. what happened, right? So understanding the plight of our young people, we took a proposal to uh, HUD. Then we took the pro to proposal to the House side of Congress and partnered with Mike Turner, uh, Representative Mike Turner out of Dayton, Ohio. And Senator Rob Portman, um, who's another Ohio um, legislator, 
and said, how do we make this happen? And mind you, that's on both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican. So when it comes to housing and child welfare, anything, it should be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to make sure that the legislation was bipartisan. That way, have an easier time being passed federally. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to get a meeting with uh, the, the secretary at the time, which was Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson, who was the secretary of HUD. And the beautiful thing about the meeting, we met with him in March. By June, we were issuing the first voucher. He had the regulatory authority to make it happen, and he did. And while he was doing that, we ran simultaneously to get this into law. So now you have the Foster Youth, Foster Youth to Independence Initiative, which is the vouchers, and then you have the Foster Youth um, POSHA, which is the Foster Youth Stable Housing Opportunities Act, which is now law, which also grants, again, it just codifies the, the vouchers. That mm -hmm. way they can't be taken out. Like mm -hmm. they, you can't say this program is gonna stop. Uh, so there's continuously money being allocated for these vouchers. So, you know, when you talk about million, you talk about millions of dollars that we've opened up mm -hmm. and able to support, support this initiative uh, across the country. And it's not going away anytime soon. <laughs> that's that's phenomenal, phenomenal. And I just think back to what you were, what you said earlier. A lot of what we do is not so we can reap it ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's for those who come after us. That's you it. know, it's it it. it, it that's it. Because think about it. When we started advocating for housing, I was well into my, I was well into about to be 40, right? I was literally about to be 40. The legislation we were writing, the cutoff was 24, mm -hmm. right? So ain't no way in hell I was going to be able to utilize <laughs> these services. And, and again, it's not a, it, it's not about that. And those yeah. of us that are advocates know mm -hmm. those things that we advocate for, we would never use. Nah. We would never use. Well, that all depends on how old you are, right? But some of us older folk, we won't use them. Nah, I'm getting up there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we won't. Yeah, we won't. But it's it's one of those things where, you know, how do you know you're doing a good job? Or how do you know that you're in the space you should be in? Uh -huh. When I go to when I go to sleep, if it I sleep like a baby until my yeah. kids start waking me up because I can peacefully rest knowing that the job that I did today served people. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's you, it. You, you also spoke about, and, you know, as I get ready to, you know, end it out, you know, want to be mindful for <laughs> your time. You know, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right, man. That's all right. We, 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 we having um, a good time. You also spoke about um, going to these events, you know, and having that feeling, you know, that excitement. You leave the event and what have you. I remember going to these conferences, going to all these different things, opportunity night. I was like, look, I I don't know what it, what we gonna do, but let me go there, you know. And I used to collect cards, be networking, mm -hmm. talking to people, and that's why like all these people were like, you know, Michael, how did you do? It? Look, when I had the opportunity. I was, hey, how you doing? My name is Michael D. Davis Thomas, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's literally, you know, how I was able to network and connect. You know, that's a little tip for you guys out there listening, college students, young adults, you know, youth, network while you can. Go, go places and be network, like, introduce network. yourself. Tell them your name, you know, uh, what your goal is. You get get an elevator pitch, you hey, know. <laughs> listen, and be authentic. Listen, be authentic with it, right? Uh -huh. Be authentic and be bold. Because I tell you, people remember how you made them feel, not yes. what you said, right? Maya Angelou said it best. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, you know, like I said, I can't say it like she said it, but she said it best. <laughs> and when we talk about networking, get just uh -huh. get out there. Don't yeah. be afraid. Be bold. You might be nervous. Mm -hmm. but the moment you shake that first hand and you make eye contact and say, this is who I am, that nervousness goes away. 
yeah. then it becomes second nature, mm -hmm. right? But, but I will tell you, relationships matter. Yes. And not those little superficial relationships where you're thinking you can uh, recoup whatever you put in it, right? It's not about that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been plenty of people that, you know, I solicited for business, but I will still check out and check up on. I will go to some of the company events. You know, I might not be doing anything there, but being in the space. Mm -hmm. But that's how you show up. Yeah. Because eventually what's going to happen is people are going to say, oh, you know, that Michael dude, <laughs> he was here. Yeah. He was here. Let's let's bring him for real. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he supports. So it, it's about doing things um, authentically and doing them with a presence of mind of building, like truly yeah. building. Right. Mm -hmm. So just a little, just a little something. You no, 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 no. Because, you know, I think about how I was able to get this far. Yeah. You're talking about 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, mm -hmm. and then 22, and then just now 23. Right. And so that's six, six, seven, six, seven years of instability, mm -hmm. six, seven years. And what got me by was my connection to people. You know, um, hey, Michael, I, look, I don't know if this opportunity is what, look, but look, how can I get there? I got you, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that turned into opportunities for me today. You know, it, it, and yep. just being real with you guys, it's a lot of pro bono stuff. It's a lot of pro bono stuff, you know, and, and if you can, I, I tell you like, and advocacy, you, there are some internships out here, but also it's what you, what you do with your heart and people seeing that, but also you're going to oh, get yeah. to a level, you're going to get to a level where, you know, people don't mind paying you for your work. People don't mind yeah. paying you for your experience and what have you, but also, you know, buy your time, learn, you know, um, speak to who you can but i was mentioning something and then my mind went somewhere else <laughs> no but we, you said but you said something about pro bono i do i have in my schedule and in my mind mm -hmm. to do at least i'm at the point <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I allot for at least four pro bono events a year mm -hmm. um because it's still about it's still about giving back yeah right it's still about um you know, letting even the people that don't have the budget, you know, get to experience yeah. whatever they think I have, <laughs> right? So it's, so it's one of those things where, you know, still be humble. And even, yeah. I mean, even now I've done, I've, I've, they're like, again, a part of the, the, the four pro bono is, mm -hmm. you know, I'll take, I'll take a couple opportunities or a couple events that are well below, you know, my rate, mm -hmm. my typical rate, because it's about the work. Yes. Right. It's about yep. the impact. And, you know, you want to be able to mm -hmm. have impact in almost every space. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to make, you have to make yourself available for those things. Definitely. Um, we were speaking, you know, earlier about, you know, the experience and the feeling you get coming from conferences and doing these different things. You know, I was speaking with someone earlier today and I was like, I learned like we would get this very exhilarating feeling. You know, you go to these conferences and then you got this little high, you're like, oh, this will make change. And you go home and everybody blah. You know, mm -hmm. I learned that like I picked up on it and I was like I don't like this you know I really every time I go you know I get this you know and then it just dies out like you know I, I just like I, I don't want that and I I have worked so hard and I, I prayed and you know asked God for the necessary tools to be able to do so to to be that space Mm -hmm. That I'm not at the I like my the energy that I give that I'm shifting the atmospheres that I work in, you know, and that I'm speaking in and what have you, because I, I just like 
I don't want that energy, that change making energy, you know, yeah. that that the beat of the because I can't speak today, but it's just the inspiration of it all. So, you know, you got to wait to that next annual conference. You got to wait to, you know, so everything that I've done, like for this podcast to, you know, the lives to, you know, everything else, like it's all about providing a space where that atmosphere can live, you know. And, and you have to do it intentionally, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you mentioned leaving leaving the conferences and going back to a space where it's it, the energy is not where you just came from. Yeah. I think it's important that part of how we live or how we mm-hmm. should live is making sure that the spaces that we are living in day in and day out. Yeah. The, that energy is something that we demand. Yeah. Right. Now, if it's something that to a point where like you don't like you live by yourself and you don't have people that's going to be helping you create that type of energy, then what you have to do is what are some things you can put in your place that's going to spark Mm -hmm. that type of energy, right? I have a good friend. They love plants, right? So Mm -hmm. from home to the office, that's all you see is plants Mm -hmm. and it's plants. It's plants that makes them happy. It makes them smile. If it's music, my kids, um, me and my, we, the, the whole family are musicians. So, you know, music for us is what gives us that feeling, right? Yeah. Being able to dissect, you know, music and chords and, and tones mm-hmm. and things like that, or listening to them play, mm-hmm. you know, that helps create that atmosphere of, yeah. of what we want or how we feel on stage. Um, but also, in creating this atmosphere, being okay with being still. Yeah. Right. You're not being still because you're depressed. You're not being still because you're showing a lot of anxiety. You're being still because you're soaking in the joy of what you just did. Mm -hmm. Right. You're processing the many feelings and the many comments that you heard after you are done. So being able to be still in those moments helps create that space of gratitude. And I think that's what it is. It's the gratitude. Yeah. And you, you can't expect that from people, not from everybody, right? Not from yeah. everybody. And if you can't, and if you don't expect that from everybody, you have to know when to get in a space where you don't have to worry about that, right? Mm-hmm. So, but we, boy, look, we talked for another hour about this. Don't get, don't, don't get look, me look, started. Hey, don't get me started. We <laughs> <laughs> so say, don't, don't get me to preaching. Look, look, that trying to tell you, um, it's light work for me. <laughs> what advice would you like to leave here today? I know we kind of gave a whole bunch of tips and tidbits along the way. Like we just shooting down the train tracks, you know, but if you could leave anything, one thing, two things, three things, you know, what would you like to leave here today um, for the audience listening? Well, um, you know, that's always hard because it's like, you know, when you said that, I started thinking of, you know, God rest his soul, Jerry Springer, when he was always at the end of his show, giving Jerry's last thoughts, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Jerry's last thoughts. And um, I, I, the only thought I really have to leave is find your space of love, your circle mm. of love, because this world can be um, unforgiving. And everything that we go through outside of our door could be very unforgiving. Make sure you have your circle of love. They do not have to live in your space. Mm -hmm. Somebody that you can call all hours of the night, make sure that you have that person because they make all the difference. They make all the difference. 
and it's easy for us to lean on those people that we love versus leaning on those that don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, find your circle of love and make sure that they are intact. Well, I just want to say I truly appreciate your time and being on here. Listen, you know, it's an honor. Uh, when you yeah, asked, I was like, like <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Hell yeah. No brainer. Oh man, you know, it look, that um what is that? Uh I'm trying to blank. Um, anyways. <laughs> um yeah, it, it it's just, you know doing this for a long time and, and you know i'm just so appreciative you know of mm. my colleagues around me you know i'm so appreciative of your work and all the others out there you know when i had i'm just it's so modest me like look i understand if you can't <laughs> you know i understand <laughs> it you know but it would truly be appreciated you know because um, i understand we all have a story to tell yeah. and i have more and more that i'm doing this i'm realizing resilient voices and the beyond you know isn't just you know child welfare you know um there are so many individuals that should have been in child in child welfare you mm -hmm. know could have been in child welfare been. you know did end up in child welfare and still felt you know and 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 and, and the people outside of that the people who were impacted by a family member being in childhood, you know, it's so many different stories, but also like you have mentioned today, society touches on so many different areas of trauma mm -hmm. from school shootings to suicides, to pandemics, to homelessness, to economic, you know, um, situations people not you know being able to spend time with their kids because they have to work three jobs to just be able to sustain and have food on their table you know um just life's disproportionalities you yeah. know and these are just normal things within life nowadays we we've touched on so many different things here today and i truly hope you guys out there listening take heed you know I definitely did. I took in a lot, you know, made some mental notes, you know, um, got some things I'm about to go put into my prayer book, you know, and, and talk to God about. But before I get into in closing this out, you know, um, feel like I'm doing a sermon or what have you. When we get That's to this right. closing. <laughs> before I get to my Listen, outro. We, we landed, look, we landed in the plane. We landed in the plane, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Be over here. All right, y'all. I know. Uh, just give me five more seconds. <laughs> um, any last comments? And this is really a space. If you got a book, an album, anything that you're doing, your business, or what have you, I want to take the time Listen. to highlight you and your work and what you got going on. Listen, I, I will tell you, um, I am currently working on working on a book, um, so it's not out yet. But I do want to. You know, and again, it's not about me. Um, you know, if I could do this in silence, I'd be okay with it. You know, if I could do the work that I do and and not have to worry about pictures and, you know, telling people where I am um, speaking, I, I would because I, it's not about that for me, especially as I get older. Um, but what I will say is, Michael, you have something phenomenal here, you know, in this podcast and i think what i would love for you to or your listeners to understand is that yes we are resilient yes we all have voices but where our focus is on is beyond all of that after all of that that's where we're thriving that's where we are um settling in and that's when we're being this is where we're being successful beyond foster care beyond our traumatic experiences beyond anything that life could throw at us so i love i love everything that you're doing with this podcast listen man continue to push forward continue to push forward because this is the platform people need thank you thank you truly appreciate it 
such an honor, such an honor, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> look, look, you're not, look, you're not about to make me speechless out here. Uh, <laughs> well, wouldn't that be something? A person known for words. <laughs> hey, got right. um, like, I talk a lot. Yeah. But I'm speechless. Hmm. <laughs> you know, you guys, we've talked about so many different things here, as I mentioned previously. Um, I just ask that, you know, if something here has potentially triggered or brought up some things for you, you take some time, you know, practice some mindfulness, debrief before you go into that job or go into the home or whatever you're about to do next. Take some time to center yourself. If it's something that, you know, you it's new to you or what have you, you know, and you need help navigating my my DMs, my direct messages for those that may not know what DMs is, you know, yeah. um, are open. F- feel free to reach out to me. I believe my contacts are tied to my, the social media, um, different things that this streams on to. So reach out to me. I would love to help you navigate and finding a therapist finding resources within your community. You know, um, this is like, this play, This platform is not just here for me to come on here, bam, boom, all right, goodbye. That's not it. Right. You know, the, the work still continues. People are still going through things, you know, and I will make myself available to help you guys if needed, you know, so please reach out, you know, if you want to talk something on your mind, you know, I love to listen. Yeah, and you know, w- when you finished, please feel free to put my information, my social media handles. Um, mm-hmm. That way, yes, any of your listeners can reach out to me as well. Yes, I'm available. And, you know, I, again, I am, as one of my brothers would always say, I'm a man of the people. <laughs> so, but I but I am a humble servant. So, uh, and I'll be that way until, uh, until I leave. Definitely. And you guys know I say it all the time. And I'm gonna keep saying it. It's gonna be my theme saying for season three. Now, everybody knows somebody that they can reach out to that they haven't reached out to. You know they probably going through something. Yeah, you know that you can be like, hey, how you doing? I just want to check on you. You know, um, take some time. Text that one person that or or some people might got five. You know, right some now. people got more, some people got more, more than one people. More than one person, you know, and, and, and you know, just check on those people, you know, just check on them, you know, and, and see how you're doing, you know, it it, it ain't got to be too deep or what have you, you know, if they need some help, lend a hand, you know, I realize we came together during COVID, we came together in solidarity as a nation, as a world, you know, and I'm watching as things pick back up, we fizzling right back apart. And I'm like, we have to stay together. We have to stay connected because we thrive. That's when we grow. That's when we make progress, you know? And, and, and it's, just, it's just a beautiful thing. So if you know someone, a loved one, you know, an old friend, an ex, you know, within reason with your exes, because look, <laughs> You know, I just y'all already know. Wait a minute. Um, they're, yep, they're an ex for a reason. But go ahead. <laughs> check on them, you know, see how they doing. Um, also, you know, um, I'm gonna say this because you know, COVID is still a thing. We still have other illnesses and stuff like that. If you sick, put your mask on, you know, uh, get that hand sanitizer. You know, I feel like everybody should have a pocket hand sanitizer in their car, their book bag, wherever they go on a something. You know, um, if you not if 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 you don't, that DM me, we get a GoFund you GoFundMe, and I start sending hand sanitizers out to people if I need to. You know, um, but please, we have to take care of each other. You know, if you just it's just one person take care of the next person, and that one person take care of the next person. We doing all right. We doing all right. But that being said, this has been an honor and privilege. Season three, episode four of Resilient Voices and Beyond. I hope you guys have a good night, good morning, good whenever you're listening to this. Thank you. Talk to you guys soon.